Okay, student notes, video lesson 5.6, double angle properties, day one. We're going to spend two days on this. And um, on the first thing, we're going to do some proofs. We're just going to start out with some proofs. You know you've been missing proofs, so we're going to get going with them. So it says, using the sum and difference properties, prove the following. So we know when we see this word, we have to follow um, what the, you know, the formal way of writing a proof. So if you look at both sides, may not seem like you know which side to start with, but since it says using the sum and difference property, I'm going to start with the left. And this first one is going to take just a little bit of a leap. So follow me on this. This is saying sine of 2a. Now, we could put it in parentheses. makes it a little bit clearer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as sine of, in parentheses, a plus a. Now, this looks a lot like the sine of a plus b formula, except it's a plus a. So instead of b, it's just also a. So let's look at the formula. So sine of a plus b is sine a cosine a um, plus uh, cosine b sine b. Uh, actually, let me let me pull up our identity sheet just to make sure everybody knows where I'm at here. Okay, so I'm looking um, for sine a plus b. I think I had said it wrong. That's why I wanted to look it up. So sine of a plus b would be sine a cosine b plus cosine a sine b right here. However, um, here in our problem, we don't have a plus b, we have a plus a. So it's going to be all a's. Okay, so when I write this out, it's going to be sine a cosine a plus cosine a sine a. Alright, now, these two things are the same. They're being multiplied, um, cosine a times sine a. So there are just two of them. So that is equal to 2 sine a cosine a. Proof solved. Okay. Alright, now let's look at problem 2. It's going to be very similar. Okay, so again, I start on the left-hand side, and I just rewrite it. Don't do anything with it. Just rewrite it. Now hopefully you can kind of predict what the next step will be. It's very similar to what we did in problem one. We're going to rewrite this as cosine of a plus a. Okay, now let's look at our identity sheet and let's find the cosine a plus b formula. And again, here instead of, in our problem, instead of a plus b, we have a plus a. So if we use this property, we would have cosine a cosine a um, minus sine a times sine a, which is equivalent to cosine squared a minus sine squared a. And there you go. We proved what we were trying to prove. Okay. Let's do the last one, tangent. Um, again, starting on the left, we have tangent of 2a. And you might be wanting to start on the right because it's more complicated, but just follow me here. This is tangent of, in parentheses, a plus a. And I know that I could be using the sine divided by cosine, although that seems like a lot of work to get to this. So I'm going to use the tangent of a plus b formula right here. So tangent of a plus b is tangent a plus tan b, 1 minus tan a tan b. We're going to do the same thing again. Instead of a plus b, though, we just have a and a. So this would be in the numerator, tangent of a plus tan a, all divided by 1 minus tan a times tan a. Oops, there we go. Which is equal to 2 tan a, there's two of them, and then in the denominator, 1 minus tan squared a, which is what you were trying to prove. And we just derived the double angle properties. Yay! Give yourself a pat on the back. Okay, so look on the back of your formula chart. If you notice here, oop, too far, 
If you notice here where it says double argument, this is kind of hard to move with my mouse. There we go. So if you notice, we did sine of 2x, cosine of 2x, tangent of 2x. These are x's instead of a's. You notice, though, for cosine of 2x, there's three formulas. Okay, now let's talk about that. It says cosine 2a is actually equal to three equivalent expressions that are all commonly used. Now the one we proved was cosine squared minus sine squared. And what we're going to do now is prove that it's equal, that this cosine squared minus sine squared is equal to the two others. Okay, so this is a proof that we've actually seen before. You've had one like this on your homework. So I am going to start with the left-hand side. I believe this was on your quiz as well. Cosine squared A minus sine squared A. Okay, always write. When you see this word prove, you do need to write which side you start with. Okay, now the easiest way to get from the left to the right okay, is to replace cosine squared with an equivalent expression, Pythagorean, 1 minus sine squared. And then I have my other minus sine squared a. Well, now I have two negatives, two negative sine squared. That's <coughs> equivalent to 1 minus 2 sine squared a. And there we go. We proved it. Awesome. Now you're going to do something very similar over here. I'm going to first rewrite cosine squared a minus sine squared a and this time I need to replace sine squared okay so cosine squared a minus and since what I'm replacing it with is actually a binomial I'm gonna put parentheses there just to make it clear that I'm subtracting everything that I write next this would be 1 minus cosine squared a okay so when I distribute through that negative I'd have minus 1, but I would then have plus cosine squared a, which is equivalent to 2 cosine squared a minus 1, which is what you were trying to prove. Okay, so it says you may now use any of these three expressions to substitute for cosine 2a. We've got the cosine squared minus sine squared, 1 minus 2 sine squared, or 2 cosine squared minus 1. So the tricky part is deciding which one of these to use when proving identities. We'll just work through that as it comes up. Okay, <coughs> so now we're going to talk about exact values. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> First off, when you see this phrase exact value, know that that pretty much is telling you that this is not a calculator question. You're probably going to have fractions, maybe some radicals um, in the problem and it should be an exact, not a decimal approximation from the calculator. Okay, so first off, so number one, they tell you what sine of x is equal to. And they're asking you for these three things. So have your blue identity sheet out. Make sure you have it turned to the side with the double angle identities. It's, it's on your notes from just a few minutes ago. But have that blue sheet out so you can be constantly referring back to it. All right, so with this information, I should be able to figure these three, three things out. Now notice that they're telling us something about x, and then they're also telling us what quadrant x is in. Now when you're working problems like this, it may be tempting um, to just double the sign, but that would be 2 sine x, and I actually want sine of 2x, and I have, you know, no idea what this angle is, but I do have an idea of where it is and something about it. Okay, so actually on this, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it. Now, I'm going to draw it in its quadrant. You don't have to do that. You could just write, draw the triangle and then write which quadrant it's in. Um, this is from 90 to 180, so that's quadrant 2. Okay, um, and here is my x or my theta, it's the reference angle, so the opposite would be 3, the hypotenuse would be 4, so then the missing side would be root 7 when you do Pythagorean theorem, okay? Um, you could also put a little negative here, that would be fine. Everything will work out in the end when you're working through these problems though, I will tell you that. Okay, so first thing, Okay, finding sine of 2x. 
That's a weird looking two. I'm going to rewrite that. Finding sine of 2x. Now remember that sine of 2x is equal to 2 sine x times cosine x. Now I already know what sine x is. It's 3 fourths. What I don't know is cosine x. Now since I'm in quadrant 2, and again, you could have drawing it in the quadrant makes it really obvious, but if you had also just written off to the side that it was in quadrant 2, that would have worked as well. Cosine x, regardless of how you look at it, is going to be a negative number. Okay, and also if you think about the adjacent is negative root 7 over 4. Whichever way you look at it, this is what you should get. Cosine of x is negative root 7 over 4. All right, now let's do this multiplication. 2 times 3 times negative root 7. That's going to be negative 6 root 7. And in the denominator, I have 16. Now, if you can simplify this further, that would be a good idea. Okay, negative 3 root 7 over 8. And then you're done. That is sine of 2x. Now, I'm going to switch colors here, just so we don't get anything mixed up. And now we're going to find cosine of 2x. Now, remember, you had three formulas to choose from. Personally, I would choose the formula that includes the thing that you were given so that if you did make a mistake with your triangle with the cosine x, it wouldn't affect the cosine 2x. Okay, But you could potentially use any of the three formulas. I am going to use this formula. Okay, 1 minus 2 sine x back to the original problem is 3 fourths so this is going to be 3 fourths squared okay so this would be 1 minus and this is you know 2 times 3 squared would be 9 4 squared would be 16 the nice thing about cosine 2x before I move on too quickly is that you are always going to end up squaring either the sine x or the cosine x regardless of which formula you pick so you don't have to worry on this one on cosine 2x if this ratio is supposed to be positive or negative and in another problem because you're always going to end up squaring it anyway okay so this ends up being 1 minus 2 times 9 18 over 16 so this is like 16 over 16 minus 18 over 16. That's negative 2 over 16, which is negative 1 eighth. Let me make that clear. There we go. Negative 1 eighth. Awesome. Okay. Now, did sine 2x, did cosine 2x. Now we're ready to do tangent of 2x. Now you have options with tangent of 2x, just like how we had options before with tangent. You can go through and use the tangent double angle property, which is kind of complicated, and I'm in doing so, I'm going to have to find tangent, and then I'm going to have fractions within fractions, or you can remember that tangent is the same as sine over cosine. Okay, if you don't like messing with fractions, this is actually the easier way to do this problem. Because just like before, with sum and difference, these two things are going to have the same denominator. Now I'm fully writing this out so that you can see exactly what's going on here. It's the sine of the 2x divided by the cosine of the 2x, which is the same as the sine times the reciprocal. And some people get confused about this negative. Does it go with the 1? Does it go with the 8? Does it go out in front? Pick one. It doesn't matter which one you pick. You can say it goes out in front. You can say it goes on the top. You can say it goes on the bottom. It's not both, but it's just whichever. All right? So just like before, those numbers are going to cancel because you're going to have the same denominator here every time. All right? Now this is negative 3 root 7 times basically negative 1 divided by 1. So that's going to give you a positive 3 root 7. Now one thing that kind of throws students off here is they look at their final answer here and they start to think, oh this doesn't make sense with the positives and negatives. Even though 
my x is in quadrant 2, I really don't know where the 2x is. So you don't know what quadrant 2x on in any of these is in. You can kind of narrow it down, but you don't really know. And so don't get too hung up on, oh, why is sine and cosine both negative but tangents positive? I mean, that tells you that I'm in quadrant 3. Um, but don't get too hung up on that, I guess. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, so let's look at problem 2. So we're going to work this pretty much the same way. <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write out all the information I know. So it says that we're in quadrant 4. I mean, it doesn't say it, but it gives me enough information to know that. And then I have to put my x there. And now if cotangent um, is negative, that makes sense since I'm in quadrant 4. You know, TOA would be opposite over adjacent, so this is going to be adjacent over opposite. If you ever get confused, it might be good to write that out. All right, and then what would be the missing side? Use Pythagorean theorem. It would be root 13. Don't just assume it's a 30, 60, 90. Don't ever assume it's a triple. Double check these things if you need to. Okay, so now let's find the three things again. So starting with sine 2x. Remember this is 2 sine x cosine x. You have your double angle properties or double angle identities on that sheet. Just refer back to it. You don't have to have it memorized. So this is going to be 2 times. All right, we need to find sine of x. Okay, first off, I haven't put a negative anywhere, but if I did, it would go with the 2. Regardless, your sine is going to be 2 over a radical 13, and it is going to be negative because I'm in quadrant 4. So I'm going to write negative 2 over radical um, 13. Now, I realize that that radical in the denominator is bothering you. You definitely could deal with it, but you really don't have to. Okay, I'm going to leave it there for now. And it may take care of itself, it may not. At this point, having a radical in the denominator is fine. Okay, so now let's do cosine. Cosine would be positive because we're in fourth quadrant. So adjacent would be 3. Hypotenuse would be ra radical 13 again. And again, I am not going to deal with the radical in the denominator. And it's a good thing I didn't waste my time with it because it actually took care of itself. So when I multiply 2 times negative 2, times 3, that's going to give me negative 12, and radical 13 times radical 13 is just 13. And that's as simplified as you get. Okay, so now let's do cosine of 2x. So cosine of 2x, again, you can use whichever formula you want. Okay, so I'm just going to pick a different one just to show you that it works. It doesn't really matter, though, which formula you use. I'm going to use this one. Okay, 2 times cosine x I just found was 3 over radical 13. It is positive, although if you had, if it was supposed to be negative, wouldn't even make a difference here because I'm about to square it. So this gives me 2 times 3 squared is 9. Radical 13 squared is just 13. And then I have minus 1. So this ends up becoming 18 over 13 minus 1. That would be like minus 13 over 13. So that simplifies to 5 thirteenths. And now for tangent, you could go through and use the tangent double angle formula that we derived earlier, or you could be more efficient and just divide your two answers here, which would be negative 12 thirteenths divided by 5 thirteenths. And I'm writing it, the division out this way instead of over, so that's really obvious. This is not something you would have to do, but I'm showing this to you so that you can really see why it works out the way it does. Negative 12 fifths. There you go. Okay, let's look at the next page. This has to do with general solutions. Okay, so we're just building on what we've already been doing, but with the double angle formulas, double angle identities. So we're finding the general solution, and then we're finding the particular values in the first revolution. Whether we're in radians or degrees, that'll tell you whether you're given x or theta. So we're going to have to kind of switch it up depending on the problem. Okay, so let's look at 3. We are not proving this. 
It doesn't say to prove. We're actually solving for x here. So <coughs> I look at the left-hand side, and this looks an awful lot like um, one of my identities. In fact, it looks a lot like 2 sine x cosine x, but it's a 4 instead of a 2. So we've got to deal with that. Okay, so if I divide the whole thing by 2, and I can do this to both sides because I'm not proving, I'm solving. So 4 divided by 2, that's going to give you 2. 2 sine x cosine x, and now that's a 1. I can now replace the left-hand side with something that it's equivalent to, which is sine of 2x. All right, now, since I've isolated the sine, it's just one sine, it's not a sine times a cosine or anything, I can say that 2x is equal to arc sine of 1. And now we're getting into where we're going to write our general solutions. So what is arc sine of 1? Okay, it's 90, or if we're in radians, it's going to be pi over 2, and then plus 2 pi n. And remember, with general solutions, sine and cosine, you have 2. So my other one, okay, we got to think about what, you know, I'll leave a blank here. So you got to think about, okay, well, where else is sine 1? Now, this is a quadrantal angle, so... Think about on the OAO chart, is there anywhere else where sine is 1? Or if you've memorized the formulas and you're thinking about how you get the other one, it's pi minus pi over 2, you'd get another pi over 2, which because this is so redundant, I'm not even going to write it. It's just the exact same equation. So in some cases we saw when we did general solution, there's only one, and that this is one of those cases. And I know that because there is no other place in a revolution where sine is 1, positive 1. Okay, so to finish solving this out, I need to divide everything by 2. And I'm going to go ahead and show it out this way so that it's really clear. Here I get pi over 4. Here I get plus pi n. And that is my general solution for this problem. Okay, so pi over 4 is an answer. What happens when you add pi to that? you get 5 pi over 4. And I did not mean to write a plus. That was completely random. I need to write a comma there. I'm sorry. And then, could you keep going if I added pi again? That would end up giving me 9 pi over 4, which is outside of the first revolution. So I'm not going to write that down. Um, and you could write, if you wanted to write something around it, you would write this. You don't have to write it using that notation, but you wouldn't want to use parentheses or brackets, you'd use these curly braces. Those are your two answers, okay? Um, all right, now let's look at the other. I'm going to switch colors here just to really show the difference. This one's kind of nice because that looks exactly like one of our um, identities to me, okay? Um, that is cosine 2 theta. And that equals negative root 2 over 2. So now I can say that 2 theta is equal to arc cosine of negative root 2 over 2. If you've been fine with this whole lesson, but you feel completely lost now, my suggestion would you go back and watch the very first video on general solutions, because that's all I'm doing here. I'm assuming that you understand that. Okay, so arc cosine of negative root 2 over 2, this is where we're going to have to do, we got to remember a few things. First off, I'm in degrees mode, which we hardly ever really work in degrees mode anymore, but this is in degrees mode because I see a theta here and theta means we're in degrees. Um, second off, this is negative, the argument is negative, or the ratio here is negative, so I'm going to have to use restricted range. So let's think about first what the reference angle is. The reference angle is 45 degrees. Okay, we get that because the root 2 over 2. All right, now remember the restricted range for cosine. Okay, if the ratio is positive, we stay in quadrant 1. If the ratio is negative, we go to quadrant 2. It makes sense because all students take calculus. 
in here, second quadrant, cosine's negative, whereas in the fourth quadrant, cosine's positive. So we want to go to the quadrant where cosine's negative. So what is 45 degrees in the second quadrant in degrees? It's 135. And so we'd write 135 plus 360 in. And I need to immediately write my other equation. Okay, what is the other quadrant where cosine is negative? Okay, that is the third quadrant. Okay, so now I need to take 45 degrees and place it in the third quadrant. You can either do this by adding 45 to 180 or considering the negative of 135, which is what I'm going to use. If you use the formula, and I need to move some of this over. Hold on just a second. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Let's see if I can isolate just this. Let's move this over just a little bit. Okay, well I moved everything over, that's okay. Alright, now I have room to finish this, plus 360N. You have to immediately write this because if you try to do some work and then go back and write your second general solution, just like how we did this every other time we had general solutions, you're going to get it wrong if you try to go back and work. Um, you're going to forget where your place is. So, um, now I can finish though. I'm going to divide everything by 2. And I'll finish this one out in a minute. Okay, so we have theta equals 135 divided by 2 is 67.5. And this is degrees, and then this is plus 180 degrees in. Okay, that's one of my general solutions. Okay, my other general solution I get by dividing everything by 2 over here, and you get something pretty similar. So I get theta equals negative 67.5 degrees plus 180 degrees in. Okay, here's my other general solution. Now remember, we're not just finding the first three positives, okay? In this unit, they're telling us where they want this. So in this case, they want it in the first revolution. So 67.5, that's my first angle. I come over here and I add 180, and I get 112.5. And I've got to make sure I put my degree symbol. Then I come over here and I add 180, and I'm still within the first revolution, so I keep going. And then to 112.5, I add 180, okay? Or you can consider, you can find all of these by plugging in values like 0, 1, 2, and so on, in for n. But you would just keep going until you get past 360, in which the next one would put me past. Okay, you can just box this. This can be your answer. If you were going to put a symbol around it, it would be the curly braces, okay, which denotes a set of numbers, not an interval of numbers. And that's how you do general solutions, just as a reminder, but this is how they would be applied to these new double angle identities. Okay, one last thing about the double angle properties. This is the easiest thing about them. It says um, they work whenever one of the arguments is twice as large as the other. For example, sine of 14x can be written in terms of sine x cosine x. Okay, so let's talk about how this would be. If we consider this to be like our a, okay, sine of 2a, that would be 2 sine a cosine a, and I left those blank intentionally because here our a is 7x, so we need to write 7x here and 7x here. Now, you could put these in parentheses, although the way it is written here is totally fine. Okay, so basically you need to figure out what, you know, well, they tell you, write tan 26x in terms of tan 13x. Now, you could go through and write it sine and cosine, but that's, that's overkill here. This is a case where it would be useful to actually look at the tangent formula. So this would be 2 tangent x and over 1 minus tan squared x. Okay, so this would be 2 tangent of 13x 
over 1 minus tan squared of 13x. And if, you have, if you're not sure where it goes here, they generally tell you. Okay, the only way this gets a little bit weird is when you get to cosine because in cosine you could write it in terms of just sine or of just cosine or of cosine and sine. So they're going to tell you which formula to use. So because they tell you just to use sine, you know that you're supposed to use the formula 1 minus 2 sine squared and then 5x. Okay, so just make sure you're using the correct formula when you're dealing with the cosine double angle. And that's it. Bring your questions to class.